This Faith and Finance podcast is underwritten in part by Christian Credit Counselors. If you're struggling with credit card debt but don't know where to start, our trusted partner, Christian Credit Counselors, offers a debt management program that can get you out of credit card debt 80% faster while honoring your debt in full. Contact them to get out of debt today at ChristianCreditCounselors.org. A man couldn't understand why his credit card kept getting declined. Every time he logged into his account, it said he had an outstanding balance. Hi, I'm Rob West. All kidding aside, credit cards are a powerful convenience that can make your life easier or a lot more difficult, depending upon how you use them. I'll talk about that first today, and then it's on to your calls at 800-525-7000. That's 800-525-7000. This is Faith and Finance, biblical wisdom for your financial decisions. Okay, so first I want to give a shout out to Faith and Finance contributor Art Rayner for a great article on this topic, Six Essential Practices for Having a Credit Card, and we'll put a link to it in today's show notes. One of the questions a lot of people ask is, how do I get a credit card? It could be for themselves or maybe their teenager or even a friend. How do I get a credit card? But we're almost never asked, how do I use a credit card? So what are the essential practices for using that slip of plastic in your wallet? Well, first is maybe have only one of them. Limit the number of credit cards in your wallet or purse. You can get into a lot of financial trouble with just one credit card. Imagine the damage you can cause with four or five of them. If you must have two, make sure it's for a good reason, like one is personal and the other is for business. Also, do not get a store credit card for any reason. They have ridiculously high interest rates. Bottom line, if you have a fistful of credit cards, you probably have a spending problem. Our second essential practice is never carry a balance. Credit card interest rates are always high, but in the past year, they've gone up considerably due to the Federal Reserve raising rates to curb inflation. Art uses the example of purchasing a furniture suite for $5,000 with a card that charges 20%. Making only the minimum monthly payments of $200, it will take 12 years to pay off the balance, and the real cost with interest will be nearly $8,500. So the first time you can't pay off your balance, consider chopping up your card. You won't regret it. Best practice number three, if you're not on a budget, don't use a credit card at all. That makes a lot of sense. If you don't know how much you have to spend, even for essentials like gas, groceries, and clothing, how do you know when to stop buying things? Your credit card certainly won't tell you. At least if you're not on a budget, but you're using cash only, you have to stop when the money runs out. With a credit card, you don't have to stop. You can keep spending your way right into debt. So no budget? no credit card. Next on the list of essential credit card practices is don't play games with credit cards. That means don't hop from one card to another as you transfer balances to get a low introductory rate. Remember, you're not supposed to carry a balance at all, but if you do, the last thing you want is to keep opening new card accounts. For one thing, there's usually a transfer fee of 3% or more, so you're actually adding to your balance. Plus, if you don't cancel the first card, which a lot of people don't, you might keep using it and end up doubling your debt. So instead of transferring balances, use the snowball method to pay your debt quickly, putting extra money on the smallest balance first. If you have more than 4000 in credit card debt, contact our friends at christiancreditcounselors.org to get on a debt management plan. They'll get your interest rates lowered so you can pay off your debt 80% faster. Okay, essential practice number five, never get cash advances from your credit card. It's probably the most expensive money you'll ever borrow. The average APR on these loans is now just under 25%, and on top of that, the average fee is almost 4%. If you're taking cash advances from your credit card, it should be a wake-up call that you're not doing something right with your finances. You need to learn to live on less than you make so you can save up an emergency fund. If you have money in savings, you'll never need to get a cash advance on your credit card. Okay, here's our last essential practice for having a credit card. 
always pay on time. For one thing, you'll get a negative mark on your credit report and lower your credit score if you're 30 days late making a payment. But it will also cost you money. You'll get hit with a late fee and the card issuer can raise your interest rate just for making a late payment. So put your card's due date on your calendar or better yet, make your payment, again, in full, the same day your bill comes in the mail. That way you don't have to worry about forgetting to pay. So, those are the six essential practices for having a credit card. If you follow them carefully, a credit card can be a convenient, useful tool. If you don't, a credit card can quickly become a financial nightmare. All right, your calls are next, 800-525-7000. That's 800-525-7000. We'll be right back. What's most important to you when it comes to choosing your financial advisor? Someone who's aligned with your biblical values? How about someone who will take the time to explain your options? Certified Kingdom Advisors are professionals who meet high standards in competence and integrity and have been trained to offer biblical financial advice. To find a Certified Kingdom Advisor in your area, visit faithfi.com and click Find a CKA. We are grateful for support from One Ascent Investments on the Faith and Finance Program. They manage a comprehensive suite of value-based investment strategies designed to help Christian investors live aligned with what they value most. One Ascent believes that if your values inspire the way you live, they should also inspire the way you invest. This can be a unique form of worship. More information is available at investments.oneascent.com. That web address is investments.oneascent.com. Welcome back to Faith and Finance. I'm Rob West, your host. All right, it's time to take your calls and questions now on anything financial. Here's the thing. Uh, probably you've got something you've been, you've been wrestling with in your financial life. You've been dealing with uh, making a decision about paying down debt versus saving. Maybe you've been wrestling with how to handle your long-term investments. Maybe it's some debt that's been sticking around longer than you like or how you can finally balance that budget or stay on the same page with your spouse. Any and all of that we'd love to talk about and help you think about that through the lens of Scripture. Uh, the number to call is 800-525-7000. We've got some lines open today, and we'd love to hear from you with your questions. Again, 800-525-7000. Give us a call right now. And uh, we're going to begin today with a couple of emails before we dive into your phone calls. These come into us every day at askrob at faithfi.com. Let's start with uh, an email from a listener in Florida. He writes, hello, I hope all is well. I'm almost 55. I don't have a retirement account yet. I know I'm late, but I still have time. I'm not sure which one is better for me, a traditional or a Roth IRA. Thanks in advance for your response. And I would say to this listener, uh, given your late start, and I agree, you do still have time, um, a traditional IRA is likely going to be your best option for retirement income in this season um, because you're going to want to pay the taxes in retirement when your income is likely less than than it is during your prime working years. Now, uh, if you are self-employed or own your own business, I might mention uh, that you can set up a SEP IRA, that's an SEP IRA, that would allow you to put away quite a bit more in the way of money, up to $66,000 uh, or 25% of compensation, whichever is less. That's a 2023 contribution maximum. Uh, if that's not a, a possible, make sure you take advantage of the catch-up provision in your IRA whether you choose uh, traditional or Roth, you can put in an extra $1,000 and uh, that would allow you to put in a total of $7,500. If you're married, uh, you could have a spousal IRA, whether or not that spouse has earned income, and then you would be able to put away, if you're both over 50, $15,000 uh, this year. So uh, one other thing, I assume you've already filed your 2022 return, but until you file it, you can make uh, a contribution for last year. But again, the deadline has passed, so I suspect you've already done that. All right, let's uh, take one more, and then we'll dive into your questions. Again, lines open, 800-525-7000 is the number to call. Uh, Mac writes, I'm completely out of debt and I'm in good shape with savings. My FICO score is 800. I have one credit card, which I pay off every month. I got an offer to 
open a different credit card that offers cash back. Would that be wise and how much will it affect my credit score? Uh, Mac, it would temporarily lower your score a bit because that new card issuer would make what's called a hard inquiry on your credit just to evaluate your credit worthiness. Uh, it would also rise when you open the second card because your credit availability would increase and you'd be able to demonstrate yourself to be an on-time payer with yet another card. Uh, so I would uh, go ahead and close the first card after that new one is set up. That way you avoid the temptation and the possibility of it being hacked by identity thieves. But I think the bottom line is, unless you're in the market for a mortgage or a car loan in the next six months, it really doesn't matter. That drop that you would experience from opening that new card would be temporary. Now, if you're next week or next month going to go out and buy a house, I probably wouldn't open a new credit card because that that temporary minor drop may actually push you down into a, a bracket that doesn't give you the most favorable terms and rates. Uh, but if not, I'd say go for it. It will bounce back. And if you can take advantage of either a no fee credit card or a better reward system or both, and as long as you're using them, uh, the card only for budgeted items and paying it off, then I'd say uh, go for it. So Mac, thanks for writing to us. By the way, if you have a question, send it along to askrob at faithfi. Dot com. All right, let's take some phone calls. 800-525-7000 is the number to call. We've got a few lines open. We'll begin in Illinois. Dusty, go right ahead. Yeah, hi. I just started a small business, and my wife and I are wondering about how to do tithing now, because it's a lot different than getting a paycheck and just choosing gross or net. There's all the expenses and things like that. So just maybe if you have a quick formula for small businesses. Yeah, it's a great question, Dusty. I love that you're thinking about giving not only, you know, personally, but also through your business. Now, obviously, with a small business, it's probably an S-corp. You are your business. Your business is you. So I get that. But it is a different approach when it comes to the tithe. So if we're going to give a tithe, that is, we want to apply the principle of giving a tenth uh, off of your increase. The question is, what is your increase? Now, for you personally, it's fairly easy to calculate, especially during your working years. Whatever comes your way, I would say your your wages and your income and, and inheritance and you know anything that you receive, it's easy to say, yeah, that's an increase. Not so with a business because your many businesses, based on the margins they have, if they tithed off of the gross, the business would go under. I mean, think of a small grocery store. I mean, they make uh, you know a very small percentage of everything that goes across the register. And so again, if they were tithing off the gross, they wouldn't be around. So what you have to do is really determine uh, what is the true profit. Now, hopefully you've gotten the business to a place where you've got yourself on a salary. And obviously, as that comes into you personally as salary, then you could tithe right off of that. The question would be, what retained uh, profits do you have in the business? And I would generally look at that over a period of time. So you might say, okay, twice a year or even once a year, we're going to calculate what is the profit that was recognized in the business for that period of time. And then we're going to apply the principle of the tithe at that point uh, to make a gift. But that would be after you subtract out all of the expenses uh, of the business, including your salary for you to arrive at that true profit number. Does that make sense? Yeah, I had, I guess I had I haven't got to that profit thing as I <laughs> praise the Lord I was able to write myself a paycheck for the first time. That's and great. that was exciting. So that really helps to maybe just decide just to have two categories of when I pay myself and then um, the, the overall profit. That that's very helpful. Yeah, I think that's the right way to look at it, Dusty, because as you pay yourself a salary, and that's great that you've gotten to that point, clearly, you know, as that comes in, I'd say you can tithe right off of the gross of that. But, you know, everything else that stays in the business, it may or may not be a profit. You've got to factor in all the expenses, the overhead, the equipment, you know, any any salaries you're paying, contractors, I mean, marketing, all the things that go into running that business. And then at the end of whatever that period is, let's say it's a year, maybe it's when you find 
file your uh, tax return each year, you'd calculate that true profit in the business. And Lord willing, you'll have plenty of that down the road so that this business can not only serve the purpose that you founded it and bless a lot of people with your product or service, but also it can be an engine for giving, which is a whole nother opportunity that you have as a business owner. But uh, you're going to have a lot of fun kind of figuring that out and seeing what God does as he expands your business. He'll expand your ability to give, and that's incredible. Well, I really appreciate you being on the program today. Thanks for encouraging others, perhaps, that have a business to think about their giving in this way. We appreciate it. Well, folks, uh, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, uh, Kathy in Ohio coming your way, Barbara in Chicago, Chris in Nashville. We have a few lines open, though. If you've got a question you've been wrestling with, financially speaking, uh, give us a call. We'd love to talk about it. I'm Rob West. You're listening to Faith and Finance, and we'll have more of your calls and questions on the other side of this break. The number to call is 800-525-7000. We'll be right back. Do you feel like your hands are tied with debt, preventing you from serving God? If you have credit card debt, Christian credit counselors can help. Through our debt management program, we can get you out of credit card debt about 80% faster while honoring your debt in full. For more information on how Christian Credit Counselors can help, visit ChristianCreditCounselors.org. That's ChristianCreditCounselors.org. Or call 800-557-1985. 800-557-1985. As the leading advocate for the Christian financial industry, Kingdom Advisors serves the public by promoting the integration of a biblical worldview across every aspect of the financial services industry. And we serve a growing network of thousands of Christian financial professionals, equipping and empowering them to carry biblical financial wisdom to their clients, peers, and community. For more information, visit KingdomAdvisors.com. That's KingdomAdvisors.com. Welcome back to Faith and Finance. I'm Rob West. Hey, we've got three lines open, 800-525-7000. In just a moment, we're going to be in Nashville and Chicago, but first, New Philadelphia, Ohio. Hi, Kathy. Go right ahead. Hi. I have a question about financing a home project. I'm I'm retired, so I'm getting uh, my retirement payment. I also get an annuity payment, about $650 a month. And I need to side my house. It's it's an older home, but it's, it it needs new siding. It's fairly big. And first, I was thinking about getting a home equity loan. Uh, then I, when I found out how much it would cost, <laughs> I had a quote of thirty eight thousand dollars. So I'm seventy one years old, and I'm wondering: should I get? If this is uh, being seventy one, should I get a, a large loan and go into debt? Well, so let me just clarify a couple of things. What is the 38000 Is that how much this project is going to cost? Yes, yes. Okay. And how many different bids have you gotten on this? Just one so far. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, I would definitely get a couple more just to make sure that, you know, this is reasonable and you might be able to find somebody that has a great reputation who would do it for a lot less. Anytime you're taking on a big project like this, I would definitely, um, you know, get multiple bids. Uh, Secondly, based on your understanding of the need, how imminent is this project? Is this something where if you put it off, uh, you know, it's going to harm the house in some way? Well, there's places that the siding has come off, and I those I should get those repaired. But, and I was yeah. planning on doing it this summer if I could. Okay. All right. Very good. Um, okay. So let's say that thirty-eight thousand is a good number. And so, what options are you looking at? Did you say you you don't have the cash? Is that right? No, I, I can't okay. get any a lump sum out of my annuity. Uh, okay. All right. Pay, so you so you've got enough with so. Yeah, so you've got enough with Social Security and your annuity to cover your expenses. Uh, do you have any kind of emergency savings? Yes. How much do you have? I have uh, about $10,000. Okay. And what are your monthly expenses roughly? What does it take for you to cover all your bills over a 30-day uh, period? Let's say roughly, I'd say 2000 
about two thousand. Okay, so you've yeah. uh, you've got five months' expenses. That's good. Um, tell me about the house. How much is it worth, and what do you owe on it? I don't owe anything on the house. It's paid, okay. and it's worth about one hundred and forty dollars. One hundred forty thousand dollars. Okay. All right. Very good. Um, yeah. I mean, so you could certainly take out a mortgage on this and get a cash out mortgage for the purpose of doing this project. I mean, that, that just sounds like a lot of money. I mean, for a $140,000 home to spend nearly $40,000, uh, for siding, uh, something just doesn't sound right there. So I'd spend quite a bit more time just kind of talking. Maybe there's a contractor at your church, a general contractor that'd be willing to come out and take a look at this for you before you even talk to, uh, you know, a subcontractor who might be in this business in particular, somebody who can just give you some insight on how to navigate this. Maybe it's better to do the repairs. Uh, if it is important to reside the, you know, put new siding on the entire house, uh, you know, could you just do one side and make it match? Maybe you paint it. Um, you know, so you, I, I would do quite a bit more work there. Um, if you were to go out and get a mortgage on this for, let's say, you find somebody will do it for thirty thousand. Uh, how much margin do you have each month? Would you be able to afford that mortgage payment? Well, <laughs> I've never done this before, so I'm not sure. My uh, annuity payment is six hundred fifty dollars a month. Would that be okay. sufficient? Do you think? Well, do you uh, <laughs> do you need that to cover your bills, though? No. Okay. I All could, right. I, I started getting that last year. Okay. So yeah, I mean, if you got a, a $40,000 mortgage and hopefully it's not that we'd be talking about two, $350 a month for a 15 year mortgage. Hopefully you could pay it off a lot quicker than that. If you could put, you know, nearly the whole 600 toward it, then you'd pay it off uh, quite a bit quicker. A $30,000 loan, uh, you know, would run you about $250 a month. So that gives you just kind of an idea at today's rates, um, you know, what that would look like. And if you were to, you know, put 600 a month toward it, you could probably pay it off in, you know, probably six or seven years. Um, so that would be certainly one option. But before I went down that route, uh, again, I would do a lot more homework, just making sure that, first of all, this is necessary. And number two, that it's competitive. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay. I appreciate okay. your advice. Absolutely, Kathy. Listen, all the best to you. I know this is is challenging, so we'll uh, pray the Lord gives you some wisdom there as you navigate that. We appreciate it. All right, back to the phones as we round out the program to Bolingbrook, Illinois. Justin, go ahead, sir. Hi. Um, just a quick question. I'm about to close on my house and get probably net around 100000 and want to see if I should just roll that into my next house, which I already bought. Um, I did like a bridge loan. So I have a, a 30 year mortgage for 240. And so to try to reduce that down dramatically or take some of that and put in as an emergency fund, because I have about maybe two months of emergency fund, uh, cash on hand. I want to maybe yeah. bump that up to six months. So I just yeah. want to get your advice on that. Yeah, you certainly could bump that up. I mean, I'd be more inclined if this was part of what you've been paying into your previous homes, trying to reduce that mortgage. Let's continue that trajectory and not kind of have a blip where you, you know, all of a sudden have more debt than you left with. Uh, so I'd be inclined just to plow that into the next house with the goal of getting that one paid off completely. But let's not say we're willing to settle for two months emergency funds, which means where's that going to come from? Well, it's only going to come from limiting lifestyle, dialing back space spending, creating more margin out of monthly cash flow so we can continue to build up. Maybe it's going to take you six months or a year, but build up that emergency fund to where it's going to be, but not at the expense of uh, not, you know, continuing to keep that mortgage coming down, whether it's your old house or your new one. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Appreciate yeah. it. That, that would be the direction I'd go. But again, that requires that you have some confidence that you can, in fact, do that and continue to build up that emergency fund, even if you plow all of these proceeds into the next property. Hey, God bless you, Justin. Uh, by the way, folks, if you haven't checked out faithfi.com recently, we'd love for you to do that. A couple of things you'll find there. First of all, make sure you check out the FaithFi community. Folks are posting questions, answering each other's uh, questions, providing comments as they encourage one another on the 
their stewardship journey literally every day. We'd love for you to create a free account and jump into that community. Also, be sure to check out our content, the best podcast videos and articles in biblical finance. It's at faithfi.com. Well, once again, our time went by way too fast, but tune in next time and we'll do it all over again. Before we go, I'd like to thank our incredible production team, Amy, Devin, Jim, Robert, Brandy, Rob, and Ben. Couldn't do it without them. Have a great rest of your day and I'll see you again next time for another edition of Faith and Finance. Faith and Finance is provided by FaithFi and listeners like you. 